Coming up, Skylon gets a new home. Vector Space launches. I have an off-world interview. Unfortunately, we had some connection issues between planets. <laughs> and I've got comments, and one particular one from my Lyft driver. All that and more coming up on this episode of Tomorrow. Good morning. Welcome to Orbit 10, episode 17. I'm Carrie Ann, with me is Mike and Jared. And I've got a Dutta, I've got a Ben, I've got all kinds of fun things going on. Apparently I'm the ringmaster today. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, of course, this is May Revenge of the Sixth. So thank you for joining us at the top of the show. We for sure want to give a huge shout out to our Patreon members. These are the Escape Velocity members. <laughs> I apparently took Jared by surprise on that one. <laughs> These are the people who, have given us ten dollars or more for this particular segment of this particular episode and they of course get access to our discord channel if you are interested in such things head on over to patreon.com slash t-m-r-o <laughs> what it's revenge of the sixth is that i thought it was revenge of the fifth no and awful with you. No. <laughs> like, <laughs> this thing makes so much more sense. Like, I'm sorry. Oh, it just does. Oh boy. Whatever. It's, I own this place right now. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> You're but command. I am going to hand it over to Mike because I'm we have a couple of that. launches that we do need to talk about. Some really, really exciting things. Uh, some things we can talk about. Some things we can't talk about. Mike, uh, why don't you tell us about things we can sort of almost talk about. Okay, so first off, uh, this week we had a SpaceX launch, which uh, launched a Falcon 9 carrying a classified payload. So let's check out the footage of that. This launch occurred on Monday, May 1st at 11.15 Coordinated Universal Time from the historic Launch Complex 39A at Cape Canaveral, Florida. And as I said, the payload was a secret satellite for the National Reconnaissance Office. And we can actually see the second stage separating from the first stage in this footage, something I don't know if I've ever seen quite like in that detail there. So the, the, cover, the coverage of the, the satellite uh, deployment and the second stage uh, uh, was not broadcasted, uh, but we got to see some amazing footage of the first stage during this attempt to try to land. And I don't think I've ever seen some of this footage like this, especially this re-entry burn, which is way bigger than I ever thought it was. <laughs> and holy cow, to, to, that helps me really realize what Falcon is going through re-entering the atmosphere. And you know, through these series of burns, you know, to help to slow down and still using aerodynamic forces to slow down as well. But in, in any case, this was spectacular footage of that. And uh, to see all of this and even some of these shots of Falcon as it was coming in look at that that is just breathtaking oh. I have never seen that so much detail coming in oh man so yeah let's listen to the audio of the, the successful landing attempt stage has landed back at landing zone one. It's another good day for us at SpaceX. It's a beautiful sight to see. That is the fourth land landing of a Falcon 9 at landing zone one. Thanks, awesome Jay footage, Fred. just amazing footage. Piece of cake. <laughs> that also was uh, the uh, tech tenth successful landing overall. Yeah, piece of cake, holy cow. Yeah. Uh, so that was amazing footage, and of course the uh, the mission was declared a success by the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office, in whatever orbit their uh, mystery satellite was put into. So congratulations to everyone at SpaceX for the successful launch, and everyone involved in providing that beautiful footage of this. Oh my! Yeah, that really that far camera just watching this tiny little flame like coming back is. 
pretty pretty incredible. All the colors, I think, in general, were just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, must be nice <laughs> to be able to launch at that time of day. Uh, <laughs> Even prior to that, just seeing some of the gas thrusters shoot off, I was just like, oh, wow, I don't think I've ever seen the, you know those in such detail before. So yeah. that was really cool. Yeah. yeah, some of the people who were manning those cameras were just really, really doing an amazing job. Uh, super steady hands, definitely not, no coffee for me. Um, okay, so we've got some other <laughs> launches. Uh, tell me what else is going on. So we had the uh, kind of return to flight, even though there wasn't a problem with the rocket, from uh, the Ariane space and the Yay! Ariane 5 rocket. So yeah, let's check out footage of their successful launch. Three, two, one, top. Allumage Vulcan. Allumage UAP, décollage. This rumble in the jumble occurred on Thursday, May 4th at 2150 Coordinated Universal Time from Corot, French Guiana. And this particular launch was postponed two months because of the local economic protests, which have been resolved, and that's why this launch was able to occur. Now, the payloads for this were two communications satellites. Uh, the first one is SGDC, or the Geostationary Satellite for Communications and Defense, which is a Brazilian satellite for both civil and military communications. And uh, this is another one of those dual launches where they have the uh, extra payload fairing. You can su see the first one that was already deployed already. And uh, for the second payload, it was Korea Sat 7, which is going to provide communications coverage over South Korea, the Philippines, Indochina, India, and Indonesia. And the duration of this flight uh, from liftoff to separation of the rockets was 36 minutes and 46 seconds. It's a really long, slow burn that the Ariane yeah. 5. Has, but yeah. <laughs> they were able to have a successful mission, though, and I'm really glad to see that uh, they can start launching payloads from there again. There's another two that they uh, hopefully will be launching very quickly from there as well. Very nice. And then uh, ISRO, the Indian Space Agency, had some stuff going on. Tell me more about that. Yeah, they had a really cool launch uh, just uh, yesterday on Friday, uh, early in the morning. So uh, this was a GSLV Mark II rocket that they launched. So let's check out the footage of that. <laughs> now, uh, as I said, this was yesterday, May 5th, at 1127 Coordinating Universal Time from the Shikarakota uh, launch site in Southeast India. And I really love this onboard c camera footage, seeing the first stage with its boosters mm. separating off mm. at once there. Really, really cool to see. And wow. they did not broadcast this live, unfortunately, but they uploaded it uh, quickly after the mission success. Now, the payload for this was the GSAT-9, a geostationary communications satellite, also known as the South Asia satellite. And uh, that's the their cryogenic upper stage, both separating and igniting there. So that's something that I haven't seen coming from India before, at yeah. least uh, from their footage anyway. And uh, this particular satellite is going to be giving free communications to uh, nations nearby India. It's part of their South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. Uh, the nations include Bangladesh, Bhutan, the Maldives, N Nepal, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan is expected to join in this project, but Pakistan uh, is not joining in, in receiving these free services because they're still kind of upset about India's last launch where they deployed over 100 CubeSats into space at once. So uh, in any case, though, this is helping to kind of, you know, open up the region a little bit bit more and provide all these communication services to, uh, you know, remote regions that wouldn't otherwise have, you know, cell phone service or mobile data um, or even just basic internet access. So this is a really cool project and I feel like this could plant the seeds for further cooperation, maybe even some sort of uh, um, ESA type of scenario like the European Space Agency mm -hmm. where all these nations might start cooperating together and do something cool. So yeah. congratulations for an awesome launch and uh, hopefully there's more cool things to come from this. Yeah, Very yeah. Cool. That is really cool. 
Uh, not that we had any shortage of launches this week, but Jared, <laughs> you actually have news of another one? Yes, there's another launch. Oh my gosh, it's like launch fever this week. <laughs> the best part is that this is a launch of someone that we've actually interviewed yes. on this show. So back in orbit, or excuse me, season nine, mm -hmm. uh, episode 36, uh, we interviewed Jim Cantrell, the CEO of Vector Space Systems, mm -hmm. about their upcoming company. Um, and this was the prototype of their rocket, the Vector R, that they had at that time. Now, very happy to announce that this week they had the first flight of Vector R. Now, the new Vector R has an awesome paint job, yeah. first of all, black on orange. Like that hotness. is sick. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. Now, it's a small sat launcher. It is a maximum payload of about 60 kilograms to low Earth orbit. So it's not a big rocket by anyone's... Well, I like uh, the, I, the ladder and the like pickup truck for scale. <laughs> yes. Like, that's, that's very helpful. No bananas for scale here. We got pickup <laughs> trucks for scale. So that's, <laughs> that's how we do it. Now, uh, it flew on May 3rd at 1900 UTC from the Friends of Amateur Rocketry launch site in Mojave, California, and the rocket reached an altitude of 1,370 meters. So it was basically a test of the Vector R first stage, its engine, and its 3D printed injector. Um, now, test flights are going to continue in 2017, and we have some awesome footage uh, from a drone that they actually took of the launch. Oh, wow. Take a look at this. We're coming in, the cinematic shot, and then the engine ignites, and there it goes. Watch out, drone. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, oh, you know, really the cool. beautiful scenery of the Mojave Desert. Totally. Out there. Or as Ben says, the Mojave. The Mojave. Yes, <laughs> quite nice. Wow. Now, they're expecting operational flights to begin in 2018, and they may they have said that they want to reach a launch cadence of 100 flights per year if the small sat market allows it. So, very exciting stuff coming to see someone on the show actually doing yeah. things out there. Great job, guys. <laughs> yeah. So, really cool stuff. Really, now, really cool. A, a question that I have about this story is their altitude, you know, really wasn't that high, and it's kind of, you know, considered, uh, you know, amateur, amateur rogatory mm -hmm. type of height. Yes. But uh, I was under the understanding that that's because of that's the type of launch license that they had for this, just as, mm -hmm. a t uh, you know, a full-up test, even though with one engine, even though they're planning to use three. Can, mm -hmm. you, can you shed a little bit more light on that, on what the restrictions are at that site? Yeah, so out there at the Friends of Amateur Rocketry, launch site in Mojave um, it is near a populated area mm -hmm. so you're not particularly allowed to do um, like high impulse kind of stuff um, basically high uh, large amounts of power and you also have to restrict your altitude so that if something does go wrong the rocket doesn't veer into the populated areas out there um, in Mojave so it's it's kind of you kind of got to be careful uh, when you're flying out there. So, right. and that's where the licenses and the restrictions come from. So. I, well, and then on top of that, a neuropilot in our chat room says, uh, remember folks, the early Redstone and Atlas rockets blew before a thousand feet. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I mean, that's to get to, would you say 1300 meters? Yeah. Yeah, almost 1400 meters as, uh, that's impressive. Yeah. That's really impressive, really cool. Yeah, just a quick just a quick test of the first stage for them. That was primarily what they were looking at. Yeah, so. no, I like it. Um, all right, so talking about other Very people cool. that we have talked to, this is, this is like <laughs> almost like a reunion show right now. This is so great, I'm loving this. Uh, Mike, tell me a little bit more about Spaceship Two. Yeah, so uh, Virgin Galactic uh, conducted uh, a test flight of their new uh, Spaceship Two Unity, and this was testing their feather system. So uh, they released a video showing uh, footage of that, mm -hmm. and uh, th uh, there's no audio for this, so I'm just going to uh, talk over it here. Mm -hmm. um, they did test the feather system in the um, factory before actually doing a test flight of this, and um, for this flight, uh, it was piloted by Mark Stuckey and uh, Mike Masuki, and it was the fourth glide flight of the ESS Unity so far, um, and the eighth flight overall of um, the uh, uh, HMS Eve. So with this, there was no rocket motor during the powered flight, but uh, you can see during this part of the video where they released the Spaceship 2 and uh, successfully completed the test. And I really appreciate you know, some of these uh, uh, internal camera views of the pilots as yeah. well. They, they definitely seem like they're uh, very focused and don't 
this, make sure nothing goes wrong for this. But in any case, they had a successful uh, uh, flight. Everything went well with the Feather system. And they haven't released any details as to when their next uh, flights will be for their test program before they start um, doing you know, more full of tests and scale tests with their rockets. But mm -hmm. in any case, they're still making progress and moving right along with that. So that's good to see. Yeah, it's really nice to see. Uh, as somebody in the chat room mentioned, uh, this was the part of this was one of the other tests that uh, they were trying to do uh, when they lost those pilots. So it's it's nice to see that they made a lot of progress, uh, and you know it looks gorgeous, it looks absolutely yeah. stunning. Yeah, really stunning. It's a beautiful vehicle. Yeah, so. yeah, it really is. Yeah. Um, all right, so, Jaren. Yes. <laughs> Since we're continuing the reunion show, I know here, so I know, it's so great. Let's talk a little bit about Cassini. Yeah, because, I mean, we did talk a lot about Cassini a couple weeks ago. Yeah, but we're going to talk about Cassini now because Cassini <laughs> is doing those ring diving orbits as yeah. a part of its grand finale, and it has now survived two of those orbits. Um, now it's going between the narrow gap between the inside of Saturn's rings and the cloud tops of Saturn's atmosphere, which mm -hmm. this gap is about twenty four hundred kilometers wide. Yeah. So we're really threading the needle. Um, with this here. So while it was doing that, it was taking incredible images of the atmosphere of Saturn like this. This is that polar vortex storm. The, you know, it has, uh, Saturn has that hexagon which occurs by natural processes in the atmosphere, but this is that, that vortex that's inside of the hexagon. Um, so you're looking at an area that's about the size of the Earth um, in here. So just some incredible detail um, in the atmosphere here. Now, they were expecting a, a, the environment between Saturn's rings and the atmosphere to be full of dust, um, but they were very surprised to find out that there was actually very little dust impacting Cassini as it flew th through this region. Now, when it flew through this region, it went with its high gain antenna flying in the direction that it was going um, because that way the particles of dust could hit the high gain antenna and keep the spacecraft protected. And the dust in this region is expected to be about one micron in size, which is similar to the size of smoke particles. Mm -hmm. So very, very tiny. Um, but they didn't really find anything there. The dust hits were so few and far between that they were, were kind of wondering why it was big and empty there. Wow, so, um, so some very cool, uh, very amazing imagery that we're getting from Cassini on these ring grazing um, orbits. And of course, they continue to take images of the atmosphere, Cassini getting some of the best detailed images of Saturn's atmosphere that we have ever seen. And these grand finale orbits are gonna continue until September 15th, when Cassini will eventually deorbit into the atmosphere of Saturn. Now we've got a really cool video here that shows you what Cassini was actually seeing as it was orbiting over Saturn here. So this is a view wow. from the camera Dang. on orbit as it's zipping past, you know, just barely skimming over the cloud tops of Saturn there. Now, some of the cool things that are gonna happen in the next couple of weeks is that they're actually going to raise the lower part of Cassini's orbit and they're gonna put it very close, almost into the, most in, the, the innermost rings of Saturn. So they're, they're really gonna be getting it very, very close to the rings. And I can't wait to see images of that because that's gonna be absolutely mind blowing. So hopefully we get to see some inc more incredible imagery because let's face it, Saturn's pretty. Cassini's yeah. really good at taking pictures. Yeah. So it's like the perfect combination if you really like beautiful things in our solar system. Yeah. So just, it's just, oh, it's just kind of perfect. It's funny because it, those pictures wow. almost, uh, I mean, it's incredible that, that we're getting this kind of imagery with mm -hmm. that just sort of like driving by kind of yeah, thing going on. Yeah, just a on. little narrow strip. <laughs> uh, yeah, just yeah. tiny, tiny bits. Uh, <laughs> but they're almost so surreal. They're almost unbelievable. It's almost... You know what I mean? Like it's, it's yeah. very... Like it's really difficult for you to actually comprehend yeah. the fact that you're looking at the atmosphere of another planet up close. Yeah. And it's so cool that we're having both Juno at Jupiter and Cassini at Saturn doing basically the same thing, which is looking up close at the atmosphere at the same time. So yeah. just, wow, it's just, it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, that is. Um, okay, so Mike, <sighs> let's move on to something a little bit new. <laughs> really new, actually, because uh, we're talking about breaking ground in a new test facility. Tell me, mm -hmm. tell me what's going on. 
So the new test facility that is being built is being built by Reaction Engines. They're the company that has been securing funding over the years to build the Skylon space plane. Yes. And with this, uh, the, the Skylon space plane... Yeah. <laughs> well, it's really cool because it's supposed to be an unmanned vehicle and it's supposed to be a single stage to orbit vehicle. And it would be enabled by its Sabre engine, which uh, stands for the Synergenic Air Breathing Rocket Engine, which runs on hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen is first collected from the air, and then, uh, you know, when it's in the, the, the lower atmosphere and once it reaches higher altitudes, it switches to rocket mode and uses on board liquid oxygen uh, for the rest of the flight. Now, um, they have gotten support from both the European Space Agency and uh, the, the United Kingdom government to start work on this new test facility. It's going to be located in Westcott uh, Venture Park, which is in Buckinghamshire near Oxford or, you know, west of London, if you know where that is. Not to be confused and, uh, it with includes the, uh, the, park, the Disney park that was going to be Westcott here in Southern California. For all of no, them. No. Just in case. Yeah. I know Ben got really excited at the name really quickly. Uh, okay, so sorry, go on. Westcott Test Facility. Yeah, so uh, uh, this is where they're going to be building it. And something cool about it, because there are other people that are occupying this business park, they're going to have a water silencer to help keep the noise down when they're doing test firings of their engine. And that's all this site is, is to do test firings. They're not going to conduct launches from here. Now, um, they also want to uh, test out a different version of their engine to uh, kind of have a larger family of vehicles. They want to have an atmospheric-only version. And in this photo, that's the one in the middle the white one there that has smaller versions of the Saber engines that would only be used for, you know, the, the high-speed intercontinental passenger flights, so reaching speeds up to Mach 5, and as well as having smaller unmanned test vehicles for other applications and, you know, potentially uh, having as much efficiency as they can out of their engines. So I'm really happy to see that there's more news from this company. I mean, they have been in business ever since 1989, since the Hermes and uh, uh, Hotel uh, programs in Europe uh, got canceled. Mm -hmm. So I really like this idea and I really want to see this idea get off the ground. But they're not going to start being able to do tests from here until 2020. So the Skylon space plane is still you know, many years away. But hopefully they'll be able to prove out their system and uh, do everything they need to have this project be successful. They have the support. They have the money now. So uh, I'm really hopeful that this will actually happen. Look for mm -hmm. Ben wearing a Skylon plane t-shirt any day now, I'm sure. Uh, it's definitely one of his favorites. He always <laughs> likes these kinds of stories. I'm sure he's just thrilled <laughs> to pieces right now. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, Jared. Uh, yes. Oh no, did you have something else, Mike? Oh, sorry. Oh, I just, I just wanted to say real quick that, you know, yeah. I really love this idea, but there hasn't really been much to say about them over the past couple of years. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, we have this cool idea, but we haven't been able to test our engine to even see if it works. So now here's at least progress to, to move forward with that. So. Yeah. Yeah, 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 totally. Jared? Yes. Uh, so mm -hmm. you talked to us about dark spots, cold spots, dark hot spots. Dark matter. Dark matter, which yeah. Which I did a whole space pod on. Right. Which shut everybody up. Yeah, so. you talked to us a lot about a lot of different yeah. things. <laughs> yes. Here's something else I really don't understand. Yeah, let's do some astrophysics, y'all. <laughs> um, so there's this thing called the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is basically the leftovers from this thing called the epoch of recombination. And this is 378,000 years after the Big Bang when electrons and protons finally came together to form hydrogen. So this is basically the leftover radiation from the first formation of elements in our universe. Um, now, if this is what it looks like, by the way. You have to look at it. It's, it's been stretched out. You have to look at it in, 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 in literally in the microwave region um, with that. Now, it sits at 2.72 degrees Kelvin, which is extremely cold. That's minus 270 degrees Celsius. But even though it's that cold, mm -hmm. we've detected a cold spot in it. Now, this cold spot is about 15 ten thousandths of a degree cooler than the average temperature in the cosmic microwave background radiation. Mm -hmm. And we've used data from the European Space Agency's Planck spacecraft and ground-based telescopes to help test a hypothesis. Okay. So there's, a, there's this hypothesis suggested that the reason it's so cold in this region is that it's a super void in there. So basically it's an area in the universe where there's literally nothing there. Where for millions of light years there is literally no matter in this region. Hmm. But this new research that we've done with uh, Planck and ground-based telescopes has shown 
that it's populated by the same amount of density uh, or the same density of galaxies as we find in the rest of the universe. And computer simulations of what we call the standard model of the universe, which is basically combining things like gravity, electromagnetism, weak and strong nuclear force, and all the other goodies that come in physics to explain how universes work. Um, when they run that, you get a cold spot about one in every 50 simulations. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty rare thing to actually get in your cosmic microwave background radiation. Now, there are some really wild hypotheses uh, for why this cold spot should be there. And my favorite one, um, which is yet to be proven, by the way, so just to let you know, this, this hypothesis is yet to be, um, I'm sure, even investigated. But it's just very interesting, which is that some scientists think that you can get a cold spot in cosmic microwave background radiation from where a universe contacts with another universe. So in other words, going into that multiverse theory uh -huh. um, that mathematically works, um, <laughs> we haven't found any physical evidence of yet. Um, but obviously, you know, we got to do a lot more study to entertain ideas like that. But it's just very interesting that we found this result and now we are trying to explain this result as best as we can through all the models that we can. So very fun stuff happening uh, in physics right now in yeah. terms of uh, cosmology and astrophysics. So awesome stuff. <laughs> really awesome. So this is interesting. Mm -hmm. Normally, <laughs> Jared, you would be doing this next story. Yes. Well, I did a launch story, this is which very is normally true. what Space Mike does. This is very true. So <laughs> Mike... So yeah, uh, I normally don't cover astronomy stories, but this one involves a flying telescope, yes. so I, I couldn't resist. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Tell me what's going on with Sophia. I'm talking about Sophia, the uh, 747 that NASA owns that has an infrared telescope that, uh, they, uh, that they recently used to help uh, confirm a particular theory about a star system that's pretty close to us. Um, and uh, as I said, it has an infrared telescope. We do have a little close-up of uh, that particular instrument nice. there. Um, <laughs> And with this, um, they were the, the star system in question is called Epsilon Eridani. It's about 10.5 light years away. And what this study was doing was it, it was looking at how star systems form. And Epsilon Eridani is really similar to our own sun, or a, a, a younger sun anyway. And scientists wanted to see how the planets are forming there and to answer a question they had about warm debris. You know, Jared's talking about the cold stuff. I'm talking about the warm stuff. That yeah, they're talking yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, previously, they used the uh, Spitzer Space Telescope that detected really warm material, but they weren't quite able to figure out where exactly it was coming from. They weren't sure if it was just a, you know, a really big, huge dust cloud that you know, was an accretion disk that was collapsing into planets, or if it was localized into one or two ring systems. And thanks to Sophia's infrared telescope, it turns out that it does have an inner ring like our solar system that it, <coughs> excuse me, that is shepherded by a large gas giant in, in the same way that Jupiter shepherds our main asteroid belt into the inner solar system. Now, the question is whether or not there's another gas giant that exists in the outer solar system of this, this system and is keeping that outer disk material from falling in and mixing with the rest of the system, similar to the same role that Neptune plays in our system with keeping all the, uh, or at least most of the Kuiper Belt objects out of the inner solar system. So I find that this is really interesting, especially because this is a star system that is close to home. You know, the, the, the odds are likely that, you know, our star and this star, you know, formed from the same region, you know, or otherwise why would we be so close to each other? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to see other evidence that, you know, we might not necessarily be unique because all these planets that we've been finding around other star systems really makes our solar system look weird or kind of like the oddballs. So I like stories like this that uh, kind of have a uh, some familiar uh, concepts anyway. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I like it. Awesome. Gosh, I, I, feel, I feel really good about this. You? I feel great about yeah? this. Yeah? This All is right. fantastic. So uh, keep it going with the reunion show. <laughs> We're going to take a break. But when we come back, Ben, you all know that guy, uh, is going to be talking with Thomas Cheney about space law. Uh, someone that we have previously spoken to, which is super cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really, really great show. So hopefully we're going to get a little bit more of that. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Close your eyes and picture your favorite city. What do you see? 
a graceful skyline of towering buildings. Cars and trains bustling everywhere. Crowds of people working, shopping and visiting, maybe for the first time. Tomorrow sees cities a little differently. We see buildings, but also a thriving ecosystem. We hear the cars, the trains, and envision a better way. We see cities as a place to call home, and as a place worth the journey. Cities with a past and a present, but especially a bright future. Come with us and explore the cities of tomorrow. And welcome back to tomorrow's reunion show. Now, before we get started with uh, our, our segment with Thomas, I did want to give a shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are Escape Velocity patrons. They've contributed $10 or more. We'll get access to our new Discord channel. We've also got our Orbital patrons. These are people who've contributed $5 or more and get access to free worldwide sh shipping on our swag store. To find out how you can become a patron of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, now, uh, back in the day, uh, back when we were Space Fig cast, not tomorrow, uh, season seven, episode seven, which was titled, Who Owns the Moon? Uh, we actually had uh, Thomas Cheney on, uh, uh, based on, I believe, a blog article that you'd written at that time, and uh, you know, I still read your blog, and you had a, another really interesting uh, uh, post about uh, space law at the UN. And so uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, he, you start off by saying, I went as part of the Space Generation Advisory Council's delegation to the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space Legal Subcommittee, uh, which is a mouthful. So let's start off with, what is all of that? Who's the Space Generation Advisory Council? Space Advisory is an organization of uh, student professionals uh, interested in space. Uh, we have about a thousand active members uh, from all over the globe. Um, I'm the lead of the Space Law and Policy Project Group, uh, and so we focus on issues related to space law and policy. Uh, we've tackled issues such as suborbital flight, uh, space mining, um, and we're, we're currently working on a small satellites project. And then let's continue on to the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space Legal Subcommittee. Uh, it kind of self-describes itself, but um, kind of who who is that subcommittee and kind of like who has authority there? Like, how does that committee work? Uh, and it's a brilliant day to be on because uh, today in 1959 was the first meeting of the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, or COPUS. Um, uh, it started off as an ad hoc committee uh, and then moved, and has now become a permanent uh, committee. This is the, the main UN body uh, that deals with space-related issues. Uh, there are two subcommittees. Uh, there's the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee, who, who deal with more of the scientific aspects of dealing with any sort of space activity. Uh, and then there's the Legal Subcommittee, uh, which deals with the legal it's the legal subcommittee that reduced the space law. Uh, the reviewers may be familiar with. Uh, currently, the I believe there are 83 members of the uh, COPUS. Uh, any UN member state is entitled to apply to be a member, and you don't need to have signed the treaties, although it is certainly encouraged uh, that states who are a part of COPUS have signed the treaties. Uh, there are observers, and these are NGOs and civic organizations uh, or organizations like the European Space Agency. Uh, the Space Generation Advisory Council, as an NGO, is an observer member of COPUS, uh, which means we get to attend and we, we can make a statement, uh, but we don't, for example, get to vote on, on any issues. Uh, COPUS works as a, usually works as a unanimous decision-making body, uh, members, uh, makes the decision process rather cumbersome, because uh, trying to 83 states with uh, rather different uh, opinions on a number of issues. To be on the same thing is, is somewhat difficult, which kind of explains why there hasn't been an even attempt at the treaty since the 1979 Moon Agreement. So uh, you're working now, it sounds like, on some of the um, 
uh, space resources, like we're looking at planetary resources and deep space industries that are looking to go out and mine some of these uh, space-based resources, uh, uh, asteroids and whatnot. Um, what were some of the things that were talked about there, and what are some of the, the issues that maybe we as space geeks don't think about when it comes to mining space-based resources? Uh, after the U.S. passed the, um, it's the, the law of 2015, which the full name um, always escapes me, but it's usually referred to as the, the Space Act of 2015, um, and it's Title IV of this law, Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act. That's the full title. Uh, title IV of this law is the one that supposedly uh, authorizes U.S. citizens to conduct um, space resource activities. Uh, this was a law uh, in the international list, and it was discussed by a number of states at last year's session of COPUS, and a, uh, a single issue agenda item for this year's session. And so it was, it was discussed quite in depth, uh, it was quite a popular topic. Um, and was subject of the symposium uh, that was organized by the European Center for Space Law and the International Institute of Space Law. Um, and they, they discussed this in detail. And then it was the subject of deliberations amongst the delegations. Uh, there are a number of issues that come up. Uh, one of the, the big ones is simply the legitimacy of the US law on space resource activities. Uh, there are a number of states, particularly Russia and Belgium, uh, who argue that this is a unilateral interpretation of the Outer Space Treaty, uh, which is, is illegitimate as it, uh, any option of space resource activities needs to take place on the international arena. Um, obviously, the United States rejects this argument. It's a sovereign right state to interpret uh, a treaty however they want to do it. Uh, the United States, in particular, argues that this is a perfectly valid interpretation of the Outer Space Treaty, uh, which indeed many legal scholars agree with, um, that it's a valid interpretation, not that it's the best one. Um, <clears throat> so that's that. That's one of the main sticking points, is just the legitimacy of uh, national legislation. And of course, the United States is no longer alone on the national legislation uh, front, as uh, Luxembourg in particular are considering national legislation. Um, and there's a, a few other states who have been rumored to think about space law. Uh, there are issues that get raised by space mining. Um, some of the, the, the simpler ones that probably do occur to people are just how do you regulate the activity uh, and this ranges from in, ensuring that it's done safely and sustainably with the avoidance of conflict such as who gets the mine at. You know, if, if an American company uh, gets started mining an asteroid, do we then exclude anybody else from mining that particular asteroid? If, if we say to the Chinese example, you want to do an asteroid to mine, is the way we can regulate the activities so that both are minor without new issues. Um, this is quite exacerbated by the fact that um, there's a variation in what constitutes an asteroid. Uh, two people trying to mine an asteroid 500 meters in diameter is going to be substantially different than two people trying to mine Ceres, for example, which is the size of a small moon. And uh, you get further issues such as the fact that the treaties give a right of freedom of access to all states um, and how, how do we uh, reconcile the needs of safe operations uh, with the treaty right of freedom of access. Uh, then there's other issues such as how do we ensure that this isn't a repeat of 18th and 19th century colonialism in which the Western states scoop up all of the uh, wealth uh, and the, the developing states want to get behind. But the one retort to that one tends to be that there's so much wealth there that they'll have to catch up. Um, and so what, one of the key things that really comes out of all the discussions that we've had, and in fact the industry themselves are keen to point out, is the fact that this is very early days yet. Um, and there are there are lots of unknowns. Um, in particular, we don't know how asteroid mining is actually going to be carried out. So some of the technical regulations for regarding, say, safety zones, for example, are kind of impossible to stipulate at the moment because if you don't know if it's going to happen, uh, then 
you can't really regulate it. Just want to avoid our, um, you know, we, we don't want to go down the route of either the Moon Agreement or the original UN Convention on the Sea and, and discourage uh, space development. But so, it's, it's, it's finding the balance. So my question is, what does this matter at this point, right? I mean, we, we've got these companies talking about doing things, but we're still a really long ways off from being able to do anything that was described. We, we cannot go out and asteroid uh, mine. Uh, we can't go out and grab any resources. We, can't, we can barely make it to low Earth orbit right now uh, with humans. So uh, why are we talking about this now? Isn't this just going to, if we create policy and procedure on this stuff now, isn't that just going to hinder the industry as a whole? I mean, that, that, that's a perfectly valid point, um, and that's one that industry makes, often makes themselves in warning against premature regulation. Uh, however, industry also state that they would like some sort of legal certainty uh, so that when they, go, when they go to investors and ask for money, they can say, yes, we're going to have, um, we actually are going to have property rights over what we extract. There certainly is a value in talking about it now. Um, particularly as there has been a tradition of being preemptive in space law. The, the Outer Space Treaty was, was signed in 1967. That was two years before the, the moon landings. Um, you know, we, and some of these problems that might arise can't necessarily be fixed after the event. It, the free issue is, is, it, is it one. I've got a problem that's going to be a massive issue to uh, deal with. And it's, it was foreseen, but the, it wasn't seen. Nobody really felt that the regulation of the issue was all that important until we've now got the situation in which we actually really do have to deal with this situation. Um, plus, plus the fact, we want to avoid conflict in space um, and, and a, a sort of clear regulatory regime uh, or um, even, even just sort of guidelines for how the industry should behave. Uh, will hopefully help uh, alleviate potential tensions between different country companies, especially as these companies may be coming from uh, different countries uh, who have, have their own national agendas that they want to uh, take on. And then who's going to enforce all of this, right? So we create these policies and these laws, but uh, uh, how are these, in, let's just say that I'm, I'm mining an asteroid uh, and I'm doing something I'm not supposed to be doing. How in, how in the heck is that enforceable? Under the, the Outer Space Treaty, uh, states are responsible for the actions of their nationals. Uh, so in, in the case of say, deep space industries and planetary resources, it's the responsibility of the United States government uh, to um, regulate and supervise their actions. Um, or if they're operating from Luxembourg, it would be the government of Luxembourg. And that's, that's why you get things like the, the Space Act of 2015, um, which is the U.S. government exercising its obligations under Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty to regulate and supervise uh, actions of its nationals. Um, there, there is the issue of once they're out there in deep space, um, how actually do you monitor um, that? Is a question of governments. Uh, in in the, the short term, all of these companies are going to be earth-based. Um, they're going to be, their revenues are going to be here. Their operating officers are going to be here. Uh, so you at least have practical jurisdiction over them in that sense. You may not be able to ban them, you, you physically stop them from doing something in space, but you can certainly punish them for doing something uh, after the fact. Uh, and by and what measures there are in the relevant jurisdiction. Um, on the international and is certain particularly when dealing with clarity between states, it's easier for the international community uh, to punish a member states. All right, we are losing your connection, something fierce. So uh, what we'll do is, um, uh, the chat room is saying to go to audio only mode, but I'm pretty sure that's not gonna fix anything. Uh, so uh, what we'll do instead is uh, let me know where, there was this great article you wrote, where can people go to read uh, the space law at the UN article that, you, uh, that you've written? 
And that's my blog, and I don't remember the, the specific URL. Um, it's it's thomasgenieblog.wordpress.com. That's awesome. Let's go into uh, a few of our general questions uh, that we like to ask all of our guests, which is something I don't think we did uh, last time you were on the show. I think this is uh, uh, much newer. So uh, the first question is, uh, moon or Mars first? Moon. Uh, would you go? Yes. Oh, you'll have to say it again. You cut out. Yes. <laughs> awesome. All right. Uh, when do you think humans will first land on Mars? Mid-century. And when do you think humans will set foot on the moon again? Oh, mid-century, too. Hmm. Same time, around the same time. Interesting. Uh, and um, my favorite question, why space? Because it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's also an awesome answer. All right, uh, so um, you know, I, I, I encourage everyone. I, I know we had some bandwidth issues. There. I do encourage everyone to go uh, to uh, Thomas's uh, blog. It is absolutely fascinating. Uh, space law is one of those things that uh, we don't think about a lot, uh, but it is going to be important for the future of uh, humanity as we go out into space to make sure, you know, as you mentioned, that uh, there are guarantees that I'm putting all this time and money and effort into this project uh, that I will actually. Uh, be able to get something back out of it. So again, thank you so much for taking time. I know it's like uh, seven or eight o'clock uh, at night uh, your time, but thank you so much for taking time out of your weekend to join us today. Thank you for having me. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, comments from last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. That bandwidth really was too bad. That made me sad. It was. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah. The things that I could understand were great. Yeah. Uh, and, and the blog really is quite fascinating. It really is. Uh, so totally worth it. Please go check that out yes. for sure. Uh, the chat was like, this is why you check in advance. And you, I'm like, guys, you were here when we did the check, we check, did. check, check yes. in advance. We did. Uh, so, you know, we'll leave it as is. I realize it's really hard to understand. And I know that everyone's going to leave comments on it. Um, but... Um, uh, again, check out his blog. Uh, it is absolutely incredible. And, uh, you know, it happens, right? I mean, uh, we're going to have similar issues when we try to communicate with humans on Mars. So get yeah. used to it. Get it's used good. to it, people. It's an <laughs> optical system in here. Yeah. So that'll fix it. <laughs> that will fix Higher it. Higher bandwidth, so we'll work well. All right, now, before we get into comments from last week's show, I want to give a shout-out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We've also got our Orbital subscribers. They're people who contributed $5 or more to this specific, specific episode. And, of course, our Suborbital patrons. These are people who have contributed $2.50 or more to this specific episode. They're going to get access to After Dark as soon as we post it uh, on demand. To find out how you can get access to all these nifty things and help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. And one quick other comment before we get into um, 
comments, comments. ironically. <laughs> I know. Uh, you know, we aired the Cities promo yeah. um, to at commercials ago. Yep. Um, uh, we were. We're trying to make, so Cities it will be more of a monthly show than it will be a weekly show. Mm -hmm. And um, some personal life stuff cropped up for Chris, some good stuff, some really, really good yeah, stuff. Yeah, sometimes life happens, and yep. that's, that's totally okay. In a good so, way, though. In a good way, in yeah. a good way, so we're very excited for him, but we yeah. do need to like press TiVo pause on uh, the, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly, on the episodes just for now. Uh, they'll come back uh, hopefully in a couple months uh, and, and it, it should be absolutely incredible when we're able to bring. Uh, Although I do love Chris like all back. the love and support you guys are like, where, where are cities? What's going on with cities? The cities going to be okay? I really like cities. Like that's fantastic. And yeah. it, the yeah. more that you guys can uh, help out with contributing, or let us know if you find a great story or anything along those lines, oh, yeah, absolutely. we totally love that. And uh, you know, what? even if it applies to space, maybe we might throw it into one of these shows. Oh right. yeah, absolutely. So I, you know, I, I was really, I really loved their first episode. I thought it was really, yeah. really quite interesting. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm excited to to continue doing cities, which we will continue to do. Mm -hmm. I'm also excited to bring on uh, online science, uh, which will be really cool. We'll have Lisa heading up science, so um, all all of that should be resuming by the end of the year. So don't worry, it is coming back. Just yes. not right now. All right, Capcom, hit me up with some comments. All right, so as you recall, we had Emery Stagmer, also known as Vax Hedrum, in our chat room, mm -hmm. uh, talking about reactions. That stories. was his uh, uh, apparently his seventh. Appearance. I feel wow. like at ten, at ten. Between out, like wow, Max and Palm and Bailey. Yeah. Like we need to figure out who has the most. Yeah. I feel like you know how SNL has like those five-time host yeah. coat jackets or whatnot. We need something similar. We need for, some sort yeah. of t-shirt or yeah. something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. That's yeah. the t-shirt for the episode. Yeah. <laughs> the t-shirt. <laughs> Seven-time host. All right. <laughs> Is it a t-shirt on a t-shirt? Is that what you're saying? I'm confused. Oh, yes. T-shirts on t-shirts on t-shirts. Shirts on shirts on shirts. On shirts. We're getting off track. Um, okay. <laughs> big surprise there. Okay. So first comment <laughs> comes off of Reddit and <clears throat> as this is a long one. Ready? This comes from Streetwind. Oh my, oh, a wall of text. <laughs> it's gotta be like 16 pages, I'm sure. Who chose this one? Does Not all right, let's just get through it. It's it. all right. Oh, you guys missed an opportunity to compare different control methods. That talks about how reaction wheels are better at high precision altitude control than space craft thrusters. I almost said space thrusters, sorry. Uh, but during the news segment, you mentioned Lisa Pathfinder having thrusters that can maintain spacecraft position and attitude within one one hundredth of a nanometer Enough to measure the impact of a grain of dust on the spacecraft by examining the counterfiring of the thrusters. It would have been cool to hear his opinion on that. Even more so, these thrusters on Lisa Pathfinder are electrospray, mm -hmm. electrospray thrusters. Mm -hmm. I can't say that. Uh, which coincidentally, you talked about in greater detail just two episodes ago during the interview with segment Orbit 10.14 with Natalia Bailey from uh, Axion Systems. I feel like we did touch on different thrusters a little bit, and like you know how they serve different purposes. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we could have asked him that, but uh, at the same time, I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty. But at the same time, we did talk about you know why reaction wheels and reaction spheres are better in some scenarios than say uh, our uh, reaction control system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, also, right? let me, let's take this opportunity to empower you to take this into your own hands. As most of these people are online, have Twitter accounts, as Facebook accounts are very active. That's somehow how, Absolutely. sometimes how we yeah. find them even. And feel free to start your own conversation. Now we're uh, here having our conversation with you, hopefully at all times, uh, but always feel free to uh, expand your horizons a little bit and step out on your own. Actually, be Boom. like, hey, that was, uh, I saw amazing. you on Tomorrow, and then I saw another episode on Tomorrow, and we were talking about this, and you were talking about that. <laughs> Opinions much. That's actually an incredible way to look at it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we are not the definitive final answer. We are simply the beginning, right? We get the conversation started. Please continue the conversation. Also, if you happen to be live, like we we have you can, I won't I'll turn this I mean if we fail to do it please right. mention it we have yeah. your chat like <laughs> streaming to us on multiple screens in real time and so multiple that we can... chats like I'm in Twitch right now I think you've got vmix social you're in chat.tmro.tv mm -hmm. we're, uh, we're watching all of it as Facebook, much as we possibly Twitter, can IRC all in real time I've and got you, my eye on the chat room and if you, <laughs> <laughs> if, you uh, if you have an interesting question um, yeah we'll ask it I mean that's the point of the show Definitely. is that we get you access to these cool, interesting people. Mm -hmm. Don't let me ask all the questions. I'm boring and stupid. You should ask the questions, <laughs> right? I'll just be your mouthpiece, so to speak. So yeah, absolutely. Also, again, we just start the conversations. Please continue them. He's, mm -hmm. uh, what is he? He's at Vax Headroom on Twitter, right? Yep. Yep, there yep. you go. Yeah, totally. Uh, all right, so next comment comes off of YouTube from KFR, or K. For 
Kafer. Kafer. Hey, Kafer. <laughs> this is really enjoyed the interview. So nice to hear about quote unquote simple but ingenious inventions still being inspired by bare principles and lateral thinking. Love your work, Vax. Thanks again, tomorrow team. Yeah, uh, I uh, I agree. I, th I I love this beauty and simplicity of what he's doing. Right? Yeah. It's, you have instead of having a bunch of wheels, have a sphere. Right. Uh, and I, I just I thought it was an incredible idea, and I'm really excited. Actually, I'm I'm really excited for him to actually put this on spacecraft, and and you know his invention will be orienting vehicles in space. That's gonna be really. That's gonna be really cool. Yeah. That's gonna be a really cool, exciting moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. So maybe we have to change his title from Moon Bomber. Actually, it's funny. He's in the chat room right now, uh, and he just said <laughs> he just, he's blushing. Is he gonna be a sphere assist. <laughs> sphere assist. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. All right. Next up. We'll have to come up with something. Uh, next comment comes off of YouTube from Scorched Core. I already like the name. Uh, <laughs> would it be better uh, using an optical C A S W or CASV uh, in the reaction sphere as opposed to magnetic? Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know what a C A S W is. Me too. Acronyms. Awesome. Yeah. This is why we have a no acronym policy. Perfect. Uh, uh, you know, and actually, uh, allow me to say once again. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, continue the conversations with Vax uh, at Vax Headroom on Twitter, or he's actually, like I said, uh, in our chat room. So feel free to just pop into our chat room. Uh, and he, he's here often. He said, "Head Space Baller." I'm That's cool with that. That's his new title. <laughs> Head Space Baller. Uh, I wish I. Was I don't a think space it's baller. the Canadian Association of Social Workers. Yeah, no, yeah. This is exactly. I mean, why it might be. This is or the Council for the Advancement of uh, Scientific Writing. I'm going to say writing. this is why we have a no acronym yes. policy on the show because acronyms can mean multiple things, and even with context, you don't always know what the other person is talking about. So we will usually say what what it is, and then follow it up with a possible acronym that you mm -hmm. may hear in the future. Uh, but yeah, th this is this is precisely why for. I mean, I, as long as I can remember, the show has had a no acronym policy. So that that is not the answer you're looking for, but... Uh, so I can't find anything. We have a nap. Uh, I'm so. also purposely delaying to see if uh, Vax can answer the question, but he's not been able We're to answer We're also purposely it. napping. Purposely napping? Yeah. No, no acronym and policy? No acronym policy. Either. Yeah, yep. no, TARS doesn't know. All right, moving on. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Next comment comes off of YouTube from Anthony <laughs> DeMonico. Hmm. Hello, Anthony. Anthony. Hello, so, Anthony. Uh, keep the interviews coming, but really miss the roundtable discussions, especially the ones about rockets, space stations, and moon Mars bases. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll do that, right? So that was uh, that was a comment that was brought up during our Patreon hangout, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, we, we love the interviews, um, but really miss the roundtable discussions. Uh, uh, what, I think what was decided was... Um, what we're going to do is any month that would have five shows normally, mm -hmm. um, that fifth show will become a roundtable discussion. Cool. So that's how that will work. Uh, I don't want to have too many roundtable discussions. I think, you know, we did that for years. Mm -hmm. And um, they're, they're good. But I, I, again, I think that we are, we are a way to, for you to ask questions of interesting people that you wouldn't normally be able to ask questions of. Right. right. We had George Whitesides from Spaceship, uh, or uh, not Spaceship Company, um, Virgin, Virgin Galactic. Virgin. <laughs> Tori Bruno. <laughs> Tori Bruno, right, yes. from yes. Launch Alliance. The These are yeah. incredible people that, you know, you're not going to just be able to just walk up to on some random Saturday. It's right. not a thing that would normally happen. So yeah. uh, <laughs> we, we give you, well, I mean, maybe it would. Uh, we give you the ability to, to go and talk to them uh, and ask your questions and, and, you know, maybe have an interesting conversation about space. Sure. That's why we're here. So uh, uh, and we I might have interesting discussions. We might have interesting roundtables, but none of us are the definitive authority on any particular subject that we're talking about, unless right. it has you know something to do with Disney or something. But <laughs> otherwise, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, even then, we're not a definitive authority. I mean, yeah. we do, uh, you know, we do work in the aerospace industry, but at the same time, um, that doesn't uh, make anyone necessarily definitive. We don't know everything. I mean, I this do. This is the best way. Although I, I just earlier in the episode said I'm dumb and stupid. So I, All of I us mean, are better together. You can say that yeah. if you want, but that doesn't necessarily make it true. Uh, <laughs> in the chat room, uh, Vax Hedrum says, we thought of using an optical system, but it isn't necessary. Uh, I think he was going back and forth about the magnetic things going on. Anyway, uh, so there's that. There you go. Like Answer any other question. Not very, necessary. Very active in our chat room as there well as on Twitter. Uh, all right, next comment comes off of YouTube as well. You guys are really, really uh, hitting the YouTubes, which is amazing. The tubes uh, of you. Well, because it makes it super easy to find comments because like nobody comments like basically anywhere else. Actually, I do want to say, um, <laughs> you know, YouTube is historically known for a horrible comment 
area, right? It's yes. where the trolls come out. Yeah. It's just an awful it's like, experience. Goodness gracious. But not on tomorrow. No. Our no. commenters on tomorrow are incredible. So good. You guys, you follow our five rules brilliantly. Uh, you respect each other. Uh, you debate ideas and our not people. Rules. There is. There, debates, there are five rules. Not arguments. There are debates, not arguments, That's which right. is totally legit, right? I mean, I, all four of the five rules. All four. You follow all four mm. of the five rules. It is. It is really <laughs> tmro.tv slash rules. In case you're wondering what they what they are, um, it, it is. Thank you, everyone, for playing nicely um, and <laughs> yeah. not necessarily having to agree with everyone, but again, um, you know, doing it in a respectful way. It's really incredible. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Uh, okay, so like I said, comments coming off of YouTube. This is from Nightlight A B C D or Abkhadeb. Abkhadeb. <laughs> is the image of the Earth through the windows rotating? It seems that each show the image or the Earth image has changed. And with that in mind, I watched a spot on the Earth and it seemed to be rotating from left to right. Is it a single image that changes with each show, or wallpaper that is, a, or is that a constant live video feed of the Earth rotating? That is a fantastic um, well, see, if, if, question. If, uh, if I may, sure. if I may, feel um, free. You see, what what's actually going on here is that Station Two Hundred Four is in a very very high medium Earth orbit, mm -hmm. and we're also retrograde, so we're spinning the opposite direction. So we have this nice effect that it seems to be going slower, and we're like a little bit higher up, but we're actually in medium Earth orbit right now, and so that's the effect that you're seeing. Yeah. So. I kind of feel like the yeah. hologram that, would know. exactly. Yeah, that, exactly. That's not that's not Earth, Mike. Also, that is the other thing I can bring up. I also is, feel like our pilot would know. Yeah. Yes. Huh. The, holo the oh, ship man. hologram should have known that we are not <laughs> the ship's hologram. To be fair, we didn't ever tell the ship hologram that we had moved. <laughs> yes. My server is still on Earth. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's been a hard uh, reset on the hologram. Right? Here's, a, here's, a fun, here's a fun thing to do is if you try to find any sort of land mass or ocean mass that you would recognize on Earth or even on Mars, you will be unable to do so yep. on the planet that we are orbiting. Um, so uh, it is not Earth that we are orbiting, and in fact, we will be moving the station. Uh, so um, next couple of weeks, the station will be in transit to its new planet, mm -hmm. and I am excited for that. So uh, next couple of weeks, you will not have uh, Planet X sitting behind us, exactly. And then uh, we should arrive at our new planet in two to three weeks, I think, is when yes. we get there. Like yep. that. So that'll be, that'll be kind of cool. Just a little um, journey. But as for your question as to what it is, um, I don't know. It doesn't look like anything to me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Next up, Capcom. Just wow. I'm getting applause from the control room on that. We have one, one more. Yeah, we have yeah, one see, more. See, either you understand what I just did or you don't at all and you're confused. There's nothing in between. I'm sitting here confused. <laughs> yep. So. Yep. All right, cool. Oh, amazing. Yep. Oh, Bellinger, that one's for you. So, YouTube, this last comment comes off of YouTube. Also, you need to tell the story behind this because it's hilarious. So, this one, can we read the. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Goodness. This one comes from Maneeb Khan. Hi, this is your Lyft driver. Thanks for the $14 tip. <laughs> the best part is that actually was your Lyft driver. <laughs> so uh, this week, uh, thankfully, again, I, I had full support of everyone here. Uh, that includes our director, Dada, our pilot, Dada, if you will, uh, who has been doing an amazing job with all of these comments for the last umpteenth number of shows. Uh, I try to pitch in whenever I honestly, whenever I remember. Uh, is really what it comes down to, <laughs> but I, I do try to pitch in when I can, uh, and you know, and life happens for all of us, and so. Mm -hmm. uh, but Dada has really taken up the reins on this one, and I, I want to thank him properly on air for all of these sorts of things. Uh, so this comment is not something I would have naturally chosen on my own, uh, and I don't believe that anyone knew the story of this comment before it was chosen, which is also kind of hilarious to me that it got chosen. Uh, and it is kind of amazing. So, uh, Muhammad, thank you. Thank you for commenting. If you're watching, hi, uh, I remember. I'm glad you remembered, so that's awesome. Hopefully you subscribe to the channel, TMRO, uh, on YouTube. Fantastic, uh, I, had to take a, I had to take a lift home. And I had this really great conversation uh, with my Lyft driver about all sorts of different kinds of things. And uh, I, I was really tired, which is another reason why I had to take the lift home, because uh, I wasn't driving. And I did, in fact, give a $14 tip. Accidentally. I mean, it was a little accidentally. It was a really great ride. Yeah. So, so that was that was great. It was like a 40% tip, though. And... Um, <laughs> 
You're just really generous. Oh, Which is a totally amazing. a carry on thing to do. And it that's wasn't amazing. like it wasn't like I regretted it in so much as, oh yeah, that was a lot. Oh well. Uh <laughs> like it's fine. Ultimately, it's fine. Uh, but I, I think it's hilarious that he remembered. He remember. He remembered the conversation. He remembered. Uh, Obviously, you guys, yeah, I talked about. Yeah, the show. What, what channel uh, we were on, and uh, and he commented. And he commented, which is so, fantastic. Extra bonus. That's why we use Lyft. <laughs> That's why and this is live. probably like the best reply ever. We should just edit this little section right here and send it to him. This is the whole PM show. The <laughs> whole show right here. <laughs> so hilarious. Uh, and so I talk about my Lyft driver commenting so on the show. <laughs> Stay tuned. Tomorrow Barbie begins right, right now. now. So good. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> really amazing. <sighs> on that note, oh that is our show. <laughs> I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. Next week, we've got the Fit Rocket Scientist coming on. That'll be uh, uh, Orbit 1018. Uh, if you were watching live after Dark is up next, for everyone else, that'll be available on demand in uh, about a month or so. Oh, that is a good point. I almost forgot. I'm a terrible human being. Uh, ground support also helps yes! make this show possible. That's right. Donna had that cued and ready to go, and I totally missed it. Ground support. These are people who've contributed between $1 and $2.49. Uh, this is a crowdfunded show, so our ability to travel and traverse space and go to other planets is uh, enabled entirely by ground support, suborbital, orbital, and escape velocity subscribers. Uh, so thank you everyone for helping to make this show go. For more information, patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, on that note, I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. Mm -hmm. We'll see you next week. <laughs>